pretty bull. I'm the global head coach at the Data School, and I created this podcast to introduce you to interesting people in data. Today, I'm speaking with Kathleen Tyson. She's the founder of Pacemaker.Global. Pacemaker.Global provides tools and resources to ease the transition for central banks to a multipolar economy. We're going to get her to explain what that actually means, uh, where states, uh, countries trade in diverse currencies and improve financial stability. So we're going to talk a bit of economics today, I guess. So uh, thank you for joining me, Kathleen. Well, thank you for asking me, Andy. <laughs> you know, I'm a big yeah. So we've actually been working together for, I don't know, several years now through the data school. Um, what, I, I didn't put this on our list of things to talk about, but I'm curious to know, like, uh, what do you get out of working with the data school? Oh, gosh, um, so much, because uh, I don't know if you remember, but I pinged you on LinkedIn a long time ago um, asking about the information lab and the data. Yeah. School. And that was my, my first introduction to it. Uh, and then we we started cooperating with the data school on uh, a few projects, and and what was amazing to me was how enthusiastic the students were, and how they really brought new insights to what we were trying to do. Because mm. what Pacemaker is trying to do is put all the central banks in the world, 194 of them, and other policymakers on the same page, looking at the same data. Because I see the global economy as one uh, interconnected economy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that central banks are independent actors that can make policy independent of what happens in the global economy. But because that's not the way things have worked for the last 50 years, uh, and it's going to be too slow to try and explain that to everybody, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to build data tools that allow them to see it and intuitively understand it. Okay. And those and are the types of projects we've been helping you with. That. Sorry? And those are the types of projects we've been helping you with. They are. They are. We've used existing data sets from the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the BIS. Uh, I should actually explain what these are. Uh, the World Bank, which I think people know, International Monetary Fund, Bank for International Settlements, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and other big economics data sets, which are hugely complicated and largely ill-transparent and don't make sense even to the people that maintain them, because I know that from some first-hand reviews. And we've tried to simplify uh, what those data sets are telling us down to the core, most important messages and to bring the, that out so that policymakers can understand uh, where they are uh, and understand how their peers are making policy in reaction to changes in the global economy mm -hmm. and then maybe um, adapt their policies to reduce risks and improve outcomes. Okay. For those of you that are wondering the kind of projects that we're, that we're talking about, so at, at the data school during their training period, they do eight projects for customers or potential customers as a way to kind of show off the skills of, um, of the, the consultants, but also for the consultants to get, um, for the people in training to get some practice doing consulting. So, the, so Kathleen comes in on Monday morning, introduces the project to them, tells them all the background they need. They ask her lots of questions. And then throughout the week, they kind of check in. And then Friday afternoon, they present back whatever they did. They get about roughly two to two and a half days to work on the project, yeah. which I, to me, it makes it even kind of a bit more astounding, the stuff that they can come up with in Absolutely. that short of an amount of time. Yeah. And, and they were so passionate about it because they could, once they began working on the data, they be, themselves became convinced of the value, convinced mm -hmm. of, 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 how exciting it could be to reveal that data in a way mm -hmm. everyone could understand. And because most of your students have no background in economics, the fact that they could get excited and passionate was huge validation that we were on the right path. Mm -hmm. Does it work better that they haven't worked in economics before because they're not sort of uh, biased by having this all this background knowledge of how things should work? They're looking at it like with a completely fresh set of eyes. Has that helped you? Do you, know, uh, you understand what I mean there? You know, it's yes, it's, um, and yeah. and I I suppose it's a bit mixed because okay. some of the, some of the raw tools that we get from the data school projects, you know, that yes, they use the data, yes, they deliver uh, something that's that 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 presents a message, and uh, but often we found that the the students with the the more um, experience in in economics and more international relations backgrounds were able to improve those basic tools quite a lot because they, they could see the direction of travel that was needed. 
Okay. Okay. That makes sense then. And, but that's another thing that we get out of these projects then, because some people might have a background in economics or international relations. They then kind of get to teach the other people in the cohort, the things that they know. Right. And then yes. maybe the next project that's the other way around. So it, it's, you know, we're, we're continuing to build up this, this really well-rounded team. What do you then do I with loved working with the data school? You know that and I always give every cohort a boat ride. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what do you do with the outputs that they give you? Have you ever taken them and then done something with them? Yes. In fact, um, we uh, have a prototype of our data dashboard uh, for policymakers live on the website now. Um, it's only available if you subscribe to the website. So if you, if you log in, if you create an identity on the website by, uh, by logging in, um, then you get to see the pacemaker data dashboard. And that has uh, a set of tools that were initially developed by data school cohorts, but then polished and refined um, with other data analysts since then. Right, right. Okay. And that's pacemaker.global if you're interested in, in looking at the dashboard. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. You, you won't see it if you go there just to, you know, browse uh, and go there with your browser. It won't offer you. But if you register and then come back, then you'll see the data dashboard and you'll be able to review the tools. I'd be very happy because I know, Andy, you have an enormous data family out there that follows this. <laughs> um, if, if, uh, if people that have the experience or even some of the students from the cohorts that contributed these tools, go in, have a look, report the bugs. We know that they're buggy. We know they need a data refresh, but um, play with them. Give us feedback on how we can make them better mm -hmm. because uh, at this point, we're still um, still doing some work on them, but uh, any expert views, very welcome. How do they give you feedback? Uh, right, just um, either uh, uh, there, there, there's a contact form on the website okay. or info at pacemaker.global. Okay, that's easy enough. Great. Um, so you have, I was reading through your background and I got lost in the complexity of the things that you talk about, like within like maybe your first two years of experience. And then yeah. it just gets crazier and crazier. Well, I think the crazy yeah. is the wrong word, but you know, more and more complex is kind okay. of the way. So, so take, tell me through, take me a bit through your, your journey of this complex world of, yeah. of global economics. Yeah. Let's just start by saying I have a short attention span. Okay. So um, I started as a central banker at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York where uh, in the year I started, 1987, there was this massive, huge market crash in October, um, which destabilized the global economy. And so we, we formed something called the uh, Settlement System Studies Group to look at how what happens in one system impacts what happens in another. And the reason for that was because uh, what happened in October 87 was this thing called program trading, which was sort of a precursor to algorithmic trading, mm -hmm. um, meant that futures were selling off, futures on stocks were selling off in Chicago. And then the Chicago exchanges were making margin calls to cover their risk. Well, that led to selling the actual stocks in New York so that people had cash to meet the margin calls. But because the stocks were selling in New York, the futures in Chicago fell further. And throughout the day, Viral, then. we had our hourly margin calls. And enormous flows, hundreds of billions of dollars flowing from New York to Chicago. And I was actually brought in to the president's office to explain what a margin call was because New York couldn't find Chicago on a map back then. Um, financial futures and options were still relatively new. And nobody had appreciated that there was this risk in the system of these clearinghouses making interday cash margin calls that would drain liquidity from the rest of the system. Right. So that's sort of my birth as a plumber, um, which is what central banks call people that build and manage these huge systemic risks. I was brought to London to supervise the London Stock Exchange uh, to get rid of paper from the settlement systems and improve the risk of the settlement systems in the United Kingdom. Uh, I also supervised the two huge global depositories that manage securities and settle securities for the rest of the world in Europe. Uh, Euroclear in, in Belgium and, and Clearstream in Luxembourg uh, and um, uh, various other bits of huge plumbing like SWIFT, which is the Global Bank Communications yeah. Network. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, I left uh, Securities and Investments Board to go to Clearstream because I wanted to actually build plumbing. 
And at Clearstream, I co-invented Triparty Repo, which is now a market of five to seven trillion dollars a day in secured credit. And it does actually trade daily. Um, and then I co-invented something for margins optimization, on which I've got a patent still. And uh, um, do, do, do. Oh, I got U.S. Treasuries into Luxembourg, into the depository, so that the entire world would have liquidity in U.S. Treasuries, which is the best form of collateral in the global system. Um, oh. oh, right. Oh, then I got bored with that. No, I didn't get bored with it. What happened was I saw something else in the offing being built, and I wanted to build it. And that was CLS Bank, which was going to be a settlement clearinghouse for global foreign exchange. Uh, at the time, the market in foreign exchange was $930 billion a day, which seemed big. Um, and I knew I wanted to build this clearinghouse. I saw the banner and the headline in the Financial Times and said, that's what I'm going to do next. And so I did. I was, I was brought on board with IBM as the domain expert and designed the settlement system, uh, which now peak daily settlements are over $14 trillion. Wow. So that's really big plumbing. I do big plumbing. Right. Um, and since then, I've modernized clearing houses. I've helped build Dubai International Financial Center, which became a top 10 financial center in 15 years. Um, I've modernized 12 central banks onto a fully digital, uh, real-time, transparent platform uh, that does everything central bank in a box. Uh, and um, yeah. So you're, so you're one of the big shots that nobody knows. I'm very much in the background. I mean, this is the thing about being a plumber is... Uh, nobody wants to, you know, you build a house, you don't invite the guy who did the plumbing to come live with you, right? Right, right. <laughs> That's um, a good way to think about it. Uh, so I'm our maybe architect. Uh, um, so I, I make sure that everything is fit for purpose and doesn't cause problems. Because if you notice the plumbing, it's because something's wrong. Right. So I keep an eye out for risks, uh, for um, bottlenecks, for leaks for uh, areas where one stress in the system could impact the rest of the system. Okay. And, I and is, that where the, is that where the multipolarity comes from? Trying ah, to bring multi all of these different economies together to make sure, you know, if one collapses, the rest of the world doesn't collapse too? Multipolarity is happening because we created a bottleneck in the system. Um, for 50 years, actually more than that, since Bretton Woods in 1944, the world has operated on the US dollar as the dominant currency. Everything's quoted in dollars, 85% okay. of global trade is in dollars. And it was gold before that, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, gold was the what we call a hegemonic asset before that, um, which means that it's what every country needs to, to settle with every other country. It's an actual thing as well, where money yeah. is essentially like vaporware, right? <laughs> well. Uh, it's digital. It's a digital asset. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a book entry. It's a it's a it's a we keep track of money with book entries. Yeah. <laughs> on the ledger, um, and without using Bitcoin, uh, um, or blockchain. But okay, so um, so everything was dollar, and that right. worked pretty well until um, the United States went sanctions mad and started putting sanctions on everybody and everything in every direction. And the rest of the world got kind of tired of that because they didn't. And when like was that? Sanctions. Was that was that through a certain? It started period? a long time ago with sanctions on Cuba, but people could ignore Cuba, right. right? And then it was sanctions on Iran. And again, people could kind of ignore Iran. Um, and then it was, uh, but then more and more and more sanctions, uh, right, in every direction um, against sometimes allies as well as enemies, um, right. and. And the rest of the world just thought, well, we can't really do business in a currency where uh, our access to the currency can be frozen. Our assets in that currency can right. be um, can be frozen and sometimes expropriated. They expropriated Venezuelan assets. Um, and um, we need to be able to do business with, with each other in, in value we can trust. Right. Now, multipolarity means countries doing business with each other in their own currencies or in their own assets um, without involving uh, third party currencies necessarily like US. Okay. So two so currencies part, could kind of talk to each other without having to sort of go through the US dollar. That's right. right. And 2022 has been the breakthrough year where uh, um, uh, Russia has 
uh, started doing huge amounts of uh, business. Russia was 11% of the Earth's land mass. Mm -hmm. Huge storehouse of energy and commodities. And so sanctioning Russia in February kind of was the breaking point. And so now Russia is doing business with China in Yuan, the Chinese currency. They're doing business with India in rupees. And China and India are doing business with China, with Russia in rubles. Right. So um, there, it's more multipolarity means that the old unipolar system where everybody used dollar breaks down, uh, not immediately, but bit by bit. And countries move to doing business with each other in, uh, in their own currencies and uh, through other channels. They're okay. not using SWIFT for this. Right. So that presents a pretty mammoth plumbing challenge because nobody's really prepared for this. And we don't really have uh, the systems to manage it globally or to manage the risks or even necessarily to anticipate and observe the risks. So uh, one thing Pacemaker will do is open, neutral, flexible platform to help identify, control, and mitigate those risks. And maybe some new plumbing. Yeah, yeah. So when they when they stop doing all of their business and, or business, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, they're, if everything doesn't have to go through the US dollar, some of the power then gets sort of taken away from the US and given back to, let's say India and China are, are trading with each other and they're not having to go through the U.S. dollar, the U.S. becomes less powerful from that perspective? Well, or less yeah. controlling, maybe? You could say that that's more equitable. Right. Uh, and, I mean, certainly from the, the Chinese and the Indian point of view, they, they, uh, they, they're very uncomfortable with the level of sanctions that have been targeted at them just because they're growing and successful. Right. You know, like the, the, the micro, microchip sanctions that the United right. States has ruled out this year um, they're not because China's doing anything wrong. It's just because China's too successful and they want to weaken them. Right. By denying cutting edge technology. Oh, you know, um, and you that's know, where politics comes in, right? That's that's right. Like, sanctions it, it, are, are political for the most part, right? Yes. Um, I, I don't ever want to tell a country what politics to have or what to do. But uh, as long as countries are going to move into doing business with each other, I can help them to do that in a, in a more risk averse way. Right. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, the United States has been top dog for a long time. They're still top dog, but uh, I don't think it's unreasonable for China, which is now a larger economy in uh, per capita mm -hmm. terms than the United States to want to be able to do business without being bullied, without yeah. having to do what the United States tells it to do. Mm -hmm. instead of what is in the interests of the Chinese people. Okay. So when... when and The same for uh, Europe, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So I know here in the UK, when, when, um, sanction, when, the, when the, the war in Ukraine started, we started hearing about Russian assets being frozen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's... I mean, I can't even imagine how much property Russians own in Kensington. And, you know, the more... You know, there's so many empty buildings here that are owned by people that are not British. Yeah. Um, what does that mean when they say they're freezing their assets? Well, first of all, it's, it's the, the, the list of sanctioned entities and individuals is um, uh, it's, that's, that's made up by each jurisdiction. So the EU has its own list. Britain has its own list. The United right. States has its own list. Um, in, Brit in the British context, what I find sort of um, un what I'm really uncomfortable with is that um, for a thousand years, Britain prospered by having non-discriminatory rule of law, particularly commercial law, that we didn't discriminate you, against you just because you came from a particular place or you were born somewhere else. Right. Or, uh, and our courts were famous for being the most neutral, equitable courts in the world. But the sanctions this year sort of stood that on its head and ripped mm. up a thousand years of history by... Um, targeting individuals that largely couldn't influence Russian policy. Right. Um, and, and really without any respect for customary international law that's mm. guided us for say 400 years in the case of official reserves or a thousand years in the case of the neutrality of commercial law in London. 
uh, and and even I mean it was I okay I know that that when the war broke out though it was very emotional, but attacking lawyers for trying to defend people's rights and saying that they weren't allowed to have lawyers, um, I thought was too extreme. Yeah, it just sounds like another political. You know, it's a it's a you know a, they're they're trying to score political points by doing that. Well, so it sounds to me like I, here, I, here I, the, I'm not, I'm not going to be political, but let me just say, um, all sanctions have blowback. I mean, right. one of the things I right. would like to show in the data is the impact that policies have in actual outcomes for better and for worse. Okay. And the guilt crisis that we had in the summer and in September with the mini budget is related to foreigners dumping UK guilt at record rates mm. because all of those sanctions told foreigners, your money isn't safe here. We can take it from you whenever we choose. Right. And so there was, there's been a record sell off by foreigners from British assets, that's driven our exchange rate down from 1.4 to the dollar at the start of the yeah. year. It was to 1.7 when I moved here. <laughs> almost parity with the dollar. Yeah. 1.09 at yeah. you know at its very low point in September. So that made all of Britain like 30% poorer. Yeah. Yeah. Instantly. Um, yeah. And um, the sell-off in gilts. Well, Britain was the most dependent country in the world on foreign credit. Mm -hmm. And so telling foreigners you're not welcome here and your assets aren't safe um, really undermines our ability to maintain fiscal stability. Mm. Because how can we keep spending if there's no market for that debt? Mm -hmm. um, so one, one thing I hope to do is, and, you know, and, and I don't want to lecture people about what politics they should have, but I'd like them to think through the, the implications in terms of cause and effect yeah. Uh, and see it in the data. OK, so so in a way, there should have been a bit more due diligence done, I guess, before some of those policy decisions were made in order to yeah. better in order to maybe educate themselves a bit more about the potential um, outcomes of those decisions. Now, of course, they're all essentially they're all predictions, right? You, you think yeah. this is what might happen based on the historical data. Um, February was so, it was almost an hysteria, an anti-Russian hysteria. So, uh, it, you know, it's very difficult when in that environment to try and put com common sense into the, into the equation and say, well, let's look at the history, let's look at the law, let's look yeah. at the precedent. Um, but yeah, there really wasn't any attempt to reflect. And, and that mm -hmm. does worry me because, um, uh, you know, I, what we expect of our politicians is a certain long-term uh, uh, objective of improving conditions in the country. Mm. And I think in, when you throw overthrow 400 years of immunity on official reserves, um, which we've done, um, uh, we expropriated Venezuelan go central bank gold last mm. year. That was another reason that foreigners lost confidence in Britain. Um, but when you take actions like that, they do have long-term effects. And I yeah. don't think that that was ever really part of the conversation. And maybe that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think better data, better chance at, at explaining long-term implications and maybe yeah. guiding. I don't ever want to tell policymakers what to do, but I do think they should have a fuller picture about how right. doing sanctions against one part of the world will have blowback effects elsewhere right. in policy. Yeah. Ultimately, you're trying to, through through your company, if I'm understanding it right, is you're just trying to educate them and give them the tools that they need to help make these decisions and to understand the implications of those decisions. Yes, but there's also going to be plumbing because I'm right. a plumber. Right. I build good plumbing. Yeah. I globalized dollar liquidity. I globalized euro liquidity. Um, and, uh, and if the rest of the world is determined to do business in their own currencies, I'd like to think I can build the plumbing to globalize mm. all liquidity. Okay. So that you can equitably and have liqu liquid funding at reasonable cost in every currency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's a bit of plumbing that does not currently exist. Yeah. I find uh, I, I've never done currency trading before. Uh, just a little side note here. But when the when the um, 
when the pound kind of, I don't want to say crashed, but it, when it, when it sank really, really quickly, yeah. um, I was like, okay, surely it's not, you know, it could potentially go down a bit more, but it's going to go back up at some point. Yeah. So, you know, I took several thousand dollars and bought pounds uh, and, you know, now the pound's up another 15, 20%. So within a couple of months, yeah. I've made 15% return on my money. You know, that's so right. It's a really right. interesting way. I've never done that before. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense now. You know? Okay. Yeah. I'm just, it, it's tricky stuff. And um, yeah. you never know what's going to happen next. Yeah. Well, it's an investment like anything else, right? It all, it all has risk. Yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. takes their own judgments. But that's one of the, it's an interesting thing that you've raised because but instability makes people uncertain and it makes mm -hmm. them behave in ways that they've never behaved before. And then it makes it very hard to predict outcomes. Right. You know, predict what the implications are. And to manage an economy at a national level, you should be providing a certain amount of stability so that people don't have to say, well, should I buy Bitcoin? Should I buy should I buy euros? Should I um, should I get out of this country and, and move mm -hmm. to Australia? Um, because you really don't want people asking those questions. Yeah. yeah. And you kind of are on the wrong path when they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're the two currencies I sort of understand uh, yeah. and that I'm familiar with. So I was like, and, you know, yeah. in, in, in our business, um, because we sell licenses as well as consulting, all the licenses have to be, basically, we have to buy the licenses from Tableau in dollars and then we, we turn them over. So Tom, our boss, is constantly doing currency, you know, constantly keeping an eye on currency rates because we could you know, you know, pass on some savings to our customers or make a bit more margin, however we want to do it. Um, yeah. So it's a really interesting, um, I, I've had conversations with, with that before and it's, it's really, really interesting to me. Um, it is interesting, but um, it also makes it much, you know, it, it's, a, it's an overhead on Tom's time and attention. Yeah. Where yeah. instead of focusing on the core business. Yeah. Well, but, you know, the financials are part of the core business, right? If you can oh, save a yeah, lot of money yeah. from a, a little bit of work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I ask you a, a bit more of an economics question before we get into a, a bit more about <clears throat> Pacemaker? Um, okay. What is inflation? Uh -huh. Inflation <laughs> is, um, well, it, it's changed a bit. And this is one of the things I hope to highlight with Pacemaker Tools. Um, the last huge inflationary spike that we had was in the 19, late 1970s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that caused huge economic dislocation in Britain, um, very severe recessions. Um, that was due to the oil embargo, right? Right. Well, there were, uh, there were coal miner strikes. There were um, uh, right. you know, garbage, garbage truck strikes, everything. You know, Britain wasn't working. And... Okay. Um, well, that then, sounds familiar. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and then Thatcher came in and she reformed a huge amount of things and, and things sort of stabilized and Britain got very, very prosperous. But now we're here in the at the stage again where inflation is at 10 percent. We've got strikes again. We've got dislocations um, and uh, people realize that their quality of life is diminished. So inflation is when the money that you have as savings or the money that you're getting uh, from working or from business um, doesn't buy the same thing this year that it bought last year. Okay. And with inflation running at the local bread or something, for example, right? I mean, and, and it matters who you are and and uh, where you are in, in in the economy, because if you're on a, a low income or a fixed income, inflation does a lot more harm, because right. uh, especially this round of inflation we have right now has been uh, focused on uh, energy costs, so right. oil, gas. Um, uh, petrol, huge inflation. And we're seeing that, you know, the government had to cap the increase in, um, in household electricity and gas bills. Well, cap uh, in quotes. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, it, um, There's not really a cap. <laughs> there isn't really a cap. And then um, uh, food, food, uh, because of Ukraine was 10% of the world's wheat, 12% uh, of the world's corn, 14% uh, mm -hmm. of the world's barley, um, the war in Ukraine disrupted food, food supplies and there's been huge food inflation. So if you're poor okay. on fixed income, uh, energy and food are a big part of what you spend money on and yeah. you will suffer a much higher rate of inflation than somebody who's rich that you know has more discretion. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and it's different for everybody. What is different today about the inflation is much, much more of it is imported. Back in the 70s and 80s, Britain more or right. less fed itself and it produced a huge amount of energy in the North Sea and it was pretty much self-sufficient. It did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now, of course, North Sea, North sea production is much lower. Uh, Britain imports a vast amount of its food. And so it's much more open to importing inflation through imports and exports. Mm. Okay. And so uh, inflation in that context mm. tends to be the rest of the world wanting more in your currency for what they're selling uh, to you. Right. Okay. And that can be because they don't, they don't like, you know, as we've seen, they don't like the direction of your policies or they don't trust your economic strength or they, they think that your currency is going to devalue more in future. Um, or that they don't want to hold your currency and they're going to have to trade it for another currency um, that they do want to save in. But it, it, that has become much, much more complicated. Okay. So how do you get through the, the, um, the price pay kind of spiral, right? So prices go up, employees want to be paid more, employees get paid yeah. more, so then the prices have to go up again. And you get into this, but- this spiral of, it, it, you know, when you, when it, in my head, it's never ending inflation. Okay, let me just say the wage price spiral narrative in the press has been vastly overdone because the wage increases in the UK are still well below the rate of inflation. Yeah. So it's not wages that are causing inflation. There, there's such a small component of what's happening. What appears to be happening is actually corporate profiteering. Because we've right. allowed a certain sectors to get very concentrated, um, they look at they look at the environment, the inflationary environment, and they think, well, we can whack up prices by um, 10, 12 percent. And uh, what are they going to do? Yeah. And that's yeah. That is story, sort of the story of the energy companies. They were because they had political um, pull, they were able to increase prices quite a lot, uh, even though um, uh, they didn't necessarily have the same associated rise in costs. So right. that's why their management bonuses are at record levels, their dividends are at record levels, and we're paying record levels for the same goods. Right. Um, ADF is an interesting example. It, electronics, uh, it's the electricity company from France. They're a state-owned monopoly. They provide all electricity in France. In France, the energy increase this year has been capped at 4%. The state owns EDF. They can do that, right? right. Now, EDF owns 25% of, or 20% of UK electricity production, right? So they can and here they're, they able to whack up, right. they're able to whack up the costs here 140%. Right. So, so British homeowners and British businesses are going to be paying a massive increase in energy costs that hmm. subsidizes the French. Right. Yay. Right. Yeah. Um, and now Britain is the most expensive place in the world for energy, for electricity. <laughs> um, that, of course, means nobody will want to invest here. Why would you put a plant here? Why would you build, make jobs here right. if it's going to have be a, a, the most expensive and volatile environment for doing business? Hmm. Um, so uh, it, I think you know it, 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 it's not the narrative in the press is all about wage price spiral. But what we should be looking at is, have we constructed our economy on principles that are um, equitable, sensible, and resilient? Mm. Uh, and is there, is there a better way to do it? Now, yeah. by comparing UK and comparing France, 140% rise to 4% rise, maybe we can say, hmm, the French might have a point. Yeah. It's... It, it, it's um... It's interesting because I go through this sort of chicken and egg thing where I find it kind of disgusting what the energy companies are doing by jacking up prices, but they can. And there's no, it's, it's supply and demand economics, right? It's It's, not, they can charge because they are, they can charge whatever they want. People have to pay it and that's tough. So, you know, it's, it's hard. hard I have trouble blaming them. You know, I find it disgusting, but you know, you can't blame them. They can, they can get it. So why not charge it? It's the system we've given them. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and they're taking advantage of it. 
Mm. I mean, yeah. EDF, EDF mm -hmm. is very, very mm -hmm. well run company, even though it is state owned by the government of France. And they very rationally saw what the United Kingdom was doing with privatization and with opening up utility networks. And they came over and they bought it up. And yeah. now they're using it to profiteer here and subsidize there. You can't mm. say they're doing anything wrong. It's the system we enabled. But yeah. what you can do is question, did we build a system on the right principles? Right. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, I think, uh, I think we probably won't question that for a while yet. Because <laughs> right now they are making this narrative of wage price spiral because of strikes and, and, uh, yeah. and everyone being a bit angry and upset. And it'll take, I think, cooler heads to, to look at the core issues. And I, it, this is what I like about data is that once you start putting it in data and showing flows in data over time, then to a certain extent, you can get around the politics and get, make, make, uh, make instead of judgment-based policy, uh, objective-based policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what yeah. outperforms yeah. over time? What creates a better environment for foreign investment? What creates more jobs and more stability? What, what creates savings so that somebody's there to buy gilts? <laughs> um, these, are the, you know, these are the sorts of questions I don't hear getting asked at the moment. But I think that if we were to build tools with comparative data where different policy choices by different countries could be observed objectively so that we could see what outperforms over time, maybe we could ask better questions. Mm -hmm. What you've just said there about EDF ex explains a lot of um, about a podcast I listened to, I believe it was last week or the week before um, from The Guardian, and it was about uh, Britain's water and um, how there's record levels of sewage being, you know, um, pushed into the rivers. Um, because basically, so it, it comes down to all of the water systems in the UK are foreign owned. Um, I think it's something like the U S owns, like, I think 75% of one of the water companies in the U S there's like six or seven, I think kind of regional water companies and yeah. they're all privatized. And, yeah. you know, they're like, well, why can't we just take them back? And we can't because there's a 25 year break clause. So these companies yeah. can do whatever they want for 25 years for no consequence or with a 25 year lead time with no consequences. Again, that leaves out one thing which is that when we were part of the european union they were bound by european union standards on water quality right right and so yeah. none of this dumping happened when we were in the eu yeah and in fact it didn't happen until this year because parliament let it happen parliament mm -hmm. actually refused to pass legislation that would have maintained water quality standards yeah they voted it down so, yeah. I mean, it's our own politics that have done this to us. Yeah. I live on yeah. the Thames. I'm very aware of the sewage. And in fact, my neighbors have been commenting on how, where, where have the swans gone? Where have the ducks gone? Because mm -hmm. the waterfowl population has suddenly collapsed. Yeah. Um, yeah so, it's... yeah, I'm very aware mm -hmm. of this. But yeah. I do think the choice we made, our MPs in Westminster voted against water quality standards. They mm -hmm. voted to allow water companies to dump sewage directly into our rivers and coastlines. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. an act that we decided through our MPs in parliament. Yeah. And, and that's where we should really be looking for, um, for change. Yeah. You don't expect the water companies to change. They like dumping, it's cheap. But um, if we want to change, um, now that we're outside the EU, it has to be through our own parliament. Mm -hmm. That's where yeah. our recourse is. Yeah. There was one of the companies got fined <clears throat> 92 million pounds for dumping. And that's yeah, nothing but they that. made that's, that's like a, a drop in the market. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, well, okay, well, we'll just keep doing it if that's all that if that's mm -hmm. all you can do to us. Yeah. So is there I'm pretty convinced that lobbying is one of the biggest issues with politics um, because, you know, the individual, the, the, <laughs> Don't ask it's, me it's, to pretty, it. it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cynical of me. And I just want to, I just want to run this by you um, yeah. that the, the cynic in me feels like I can't influence things because my one opinion isn't the same value 
as the opinion of a lobbyist. Uh, so in the US, in the US, there were lobbying laws before, right? That that got that got uh, repealed. So now, basically, I don't know. I'd be curious to know, like the people that voted against this, you know, clean water bill. Is there a way for us to track who they got lobbying money from? I, I really, you know, what that would be a really great data project. Okay. Um, and you know what, Andy, you do have as an individual the skills to make that happen, yeah. but nobody else has. So you you don't feel disempowered. You're actually one of the most powerful people in the world if that's what you want right. to do. It's right. find right. where did that money come from? Who did, who, which MPs did it go to? Um, you know, I don't know where that data is kept, whether it's available, but I think it'd be a really interesting idea to collect it and track it. Yeah. It has uh, to be available somewhere, right? Surely that's, well, well I would there hope is that a it's, it's of interest. There's a register of interest that's held for MPs, and and maybe that's the right thing is to find out which lobbyists the water companies hired, and what their record of interest shows in terms of of uh, um, yeah. uh, providing holidays and um, other um, benefits, mm -hmm. shall we say, yeah. to MPs. Yeah, it's what's really frustrating to me is that lobbying is essentially bribes called something else. Um, you know, I will give you this holiday if you will vote this way for me. You know, I'll give you this benefit. Um, and it's, yeah. it's not too different from when, um, what do they call it in the U.S. when they, um, uh, pork, uh, pork bill or something like that, when everybody puts their own little thing on top of the bill in order, pork belly spending, yeah. in order to get them to sign it, right? They'll get $75 million for a library that needs to be built in their area, something yeah. like that. And then that scores them political points with their constituency so that they then get reelected. So it's this game where politicians don't really know what else to do other than be politicians. Um, well, so again, their it, job is to keep themselves in power, right? Britain has changed in that respect rather radically since I've been here. Mm -hmm. I've been here 32 years. And, and I have seen rather radical change because... Um, 10 years ago, it was actually very unusual to be at, say, a reception in the city or a reception in Westminster and meet, meet people who were lobbyists. Right. And now, if if I go to something, like, it seems like every fourth or fifth person I'm introduced to is a lobbyist. And yeah. they admit being they lobbyists. They probably put them on, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's right. They sponsor those gigs. Um, yeah. And so uh, the system has shifted, and maybe uh, maybe that's another thing for review. But you know, I can't fix Britain. I think Britain is its own special little case. Um, I'm, <laughs> it's a, a lonely little island that's isolated itself from Europe. Um, yep. It's isolated itself from a, a lot of traditional friends, um, and it's just going to have to figure out where it goes from here. Um, what I can do is show Britain in context of its peers, and help it to then hopefully look at its peers and say, ooh, they're doing a pretty good job with that. France seems to be doing pretty well with energy. Um, maybe we should at least evaluate whether we've got the right policies. Mm. Yeah. And I think- So how, you, that. how would you approach that type of project uh, as part of Pacemaker then? So let's say you wanna, you wanna advise um, Ofgem, you know, of- Oh, uh, no, 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 no. You know. I can't do that. <laughs> no, I don't, I'm not gonna work at that level. Because I'm I'm sort of okay. at the abstract macro level. Um, central okay. banks are like the top of the plumbing in each country for the financial markets. Yeah. So what uh, they're they're interested in in in, uh, in flows and foreign exchange and um, in in credit and in uh, um, keeping the economy growing, keeping mm -hmm. employment growing. Um, at that level, you can make some big choices, and they will have big impacts over time. So those, that's where we're starting. Um, you know, whether there's, there's granular levels of policy analysis that we could do later, I don't know. Uh, but um, off Jim's not on my radar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, um, I just completely lost the question that was in my head. So it must have been a, must have been a really, really good one. About the, the, the UK economy. Um, so, you know, can you explain sort of what Ofgem does? So let me let me tell you what I think it does, and then 
I'll let you tell me this if I'm not, right. So, I will tell you this is not my specialist subject. <laughs> that's okay. But I'm sure you understand it better than I do. And, and it's not going to be anything really detailed anyway. So Ofgem, it's communicated to the citizens that Ofgem creates a price cap for, you know, the average household. Well, no. um, basically what that means is it's not a cap on the price. It's not a cap on the amount. It's a cap on the price. So if you use more, you pay more, right? That's mm -hmm. which, which kind of makes sense, right? You, you use more energy, you should pay more. Um, yeah. Uh, but I also read that off gem, that's kind of like a ruse for what they do. What they really do is they're responsible for making sure energy companies don't go out of business. Um, they they haven't done a very good job this year because they've been falling left and right. Yeah. But I think that's part of the reason why the prices have gone out of control is because they're trying to make sure more companies don't go out of business. Well, each of those resolutions has cost billions of pounds. I, I read that one of the one of the failed companies to uh, to get it taken over by one of the other companies cost four billion pounds. And the citizens pay for that. And yeah. and and well, it's actually yeah, it's the electricity users that pay for that. Um, and and so those are huge costs. And yeah, they they will try and keep utility companies going from going out of business. Now that prices at the wholesale markets in oil and in gas have fallen a lot from their peak, um, it's easier to keep companies in business. And also right. companies risk management has improved. Um, mm -hmm. That huge, mm -hmm. amazing, never seen before spike in uh, ga natural gas prices this year um, caught the, most of them by surprise. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't have appropriate hedging they didn't have appropriate liquidity provision. They weren't able to keep pace and they failed. But the yeah. ones that are, are left, the survivors, have now seen that spike. They know it can happen and they're managing risks better. So, um, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't think, you know, the strange thing is gas prices started rising in April of 2021. And, you know, it wasn't just like they, they spiked when uh, Russia went into Ukraine. They did. Yeah. But there was there was a run up period where the system was getting stressed. Now, this is the kind of thing that interests me because I like to identify stresses in the system before a crisis. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is what happened in April 2021, because the prices of wheat, oil, gas, and nickel, the things Ukraine all exports, all started getting higher together. At the same time, right? Yeah. Now, to me, that's a really interesting pattern. Um, and as far as I know, nobody's analyzed why that would happen. Right. So Whether those all together are factors that are causing an even bigger mushroom. Yeah. Whether somebody knew the war was going to happen, they knew the timing of the war, and they bought in anticipation. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, but as far yeah. as I know, nobody's asked the question. So, but it's yeah. it's. I mean, I have a, a kind of a weird brain for patterns. I see patterns in data, which is one reason I'm I'm I really uh, I never cease to lose interest, and I'm passionate about it. Um, but I I saw that pattern from April 2021. Mm -hmm. So there's part of me that will always be curious. Well, who had the inside knowledge? Who was buying? Who was forcing the yeah. price up before there was a crisis? That's interesting. Does that explain yeah. then? So when there's when there's even talk of higher oil prices, um, prices at the pump um, bump really quickly. Yeah, um, even come though. Down really quickly. <laughs> even though they don't even have that supply yet, right? Yeah. But when they already have it and the prices go down, they don't go down as fast as they go up. Um, and the excuse is, well, you know, we, we have to buy futures on the oil. Okay, well, but then, yeah. you know, uh, but then, but you don't actually have the product. So once you have, I don't know, that, that whole thing confuses well, me, is, right? Because isn't that kind of an oxymoron? Uh, but this is it. This is markets are sticky downwards. Um, because you know, yeah. once once uh, once once the big oil companies are booking outsized profits, 
uh, on, and they have, they've been booking record profits, massively record profits this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they don't want to then undercut those profits for, for the next quarter or the next year. Right. And again, we've built this system. We're responsible as a nation for mm -hmm. our laws and the way it works. We could have done it differently. Um, I don't know how other countries do it. And uh, every country has been struggling with this. In Europe, there's a whole patchwork of subsidies and they're looking at European wide buying and European wide cap on prices and all kinds of innovations. Um, and it's difficult to say what's right in that context because it, everything will involve a certain amount of market distortion, a certain amount of inefficiency. But um, uh, it's, again, what's good is if we, if we can compare and maybe contrast in terms of long-term outcomes, what system provides better stability, uh, a better mm -hmm. environment for businesses to invest. Mm -hmm. Because what really worries me about the UK being the most expensive in the world is I, I can't see why any business would want to invest here uh, right. at the moment. Yeah, and then the problem gets worse and worse from there. Yeah, because we yeah. become more and more dependent on foreign foreign companies and yeah. Um, so with at Pacemaker, so you, you know, you do data tools and all, all these incredible things that you all do and you meet with policymakers and things. Um, do you ever do things around like inequality? Absolutely. You know, we do. We, we built some tools using the world inequal income inequality database, the WIID, mm -hmm. um, which, which is a brilliant tool, um, for that, uh, assesses global inequality. In fact, they've just released an updated data set. Um, and we're going to be up to updating the tool. Um, so yes, absolutely. We, we, I'm, I'm very keen that we should be able to, to show developments in inequality, um, again, so that policymakers, without telling them what to do, can trend towards better policies. But mm -hmm. uh, inequality isn't just about income inequality or wealth inequality. It's about having the right conditions for equitable development. Mm -hmm. And that's education, healthcare, uh, um, an open economy for trade, um, financial stability, government stability, um, and the, everything's in play this year because that's all been all. We're so far off the charts now, in yeah. terms of the historic record. And it, I right. don't believe we ever go back to what we had in 2019. Um, so. That's why I think new tools are needed because I'm not sure any of the old models will ever work again. Mm -hmm. And we know that our tools work. I mean, here's a cute story. We did a one minute animation um, of uh, a Nordic country's banking sectors, borrowings in domestic currency, euros and dollars. Just a one minute time series animation. Mm -hmm. And we showed it to a senior policymaker in the central bank. And the endpoints showed massive dollar borrowing, massive euro borrowing, and the domestic market almost irrelevant because mm -hmm. banks started borrowing much more in dollar and euro than the domestic market. And we pointed out that, of course, you know, were there to be a revaluation of uh, their currency against dollar or euro, uh, they could have stress in the banking sector. Now, again, I'm not mm -hmm. telling them what to do. This one minute animation made it clear there was risk. Right. And after that one minute animation, the senior policymaker said, my next call is to my governor. <laughs> and in the next three quarters, looking at the, the data. The data scared him, right? Looking at the data, the next three quarters, their euro borrowing stayed more or less stable because they're very close to euro being Nordic. They're happy yeah. with euro. Their dollar borrowings decreased by 29 billion in the next three quarters. Wow. And you know why that's a huge win? Because this year when the dollar started surging, their currency devalued by 20%. Right. And if they had still they had that, that dollar yeah. borrowing, the cost yeah. of servicing those dollar debts would have stressed the whole banking sector. They oh, wow. could have had a banking crisis. So yeah. that one minute yeah. animation forestalled a banking crisis, potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and how, again, how, I never had to tell them what to do. Yeah. So a big part of that then is the way that you're presenting the data to them. And um, I guess you're doing a lot more data visualizations and um, 
uh, you're presenting data in ways that makes it more consumable. Is that right? So has data literacy yeah. of, of, of people improved? Because obviously well, what you did okay. with animation spoke the story without you probably really having to say a whole lot. Well, this is it. I am trying to build tools that are universal, um, that will work in every language. Um, mm -hmm. And well, I mean, without having to translate it in every language, because most people understand dollars and euros. They understand currencies. Um, you can show them, you can show them data. Uh, in, uh, that are, have uh, universal relevance uh, in a very simple way that communicates a narrative. Uh, I mean, I've learned so much from you on this. You're the expert, aren't you? You've taught me. Um, and, uh, and, and then by showing them all, all over the world, the same view using the same tools and allowing them to choose how they see themselves, which peers they compare themselves to, um, putting all of them on the same page so that they can start to have conversations with each other with better understanding, right. deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's really the, the, the idea of Pacemaker is putting all the central banks on the same page uh, and the development banks, the global development banks, uh, and the regional development banks, mm -hmm. so that they can start to have better conversations about development, about growth, about risks, about um, cooperation and collaboration to reduce risks and then maybe some plumbing that actually delivers. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to switch gears. This has been just an, I've learned so much in this conversation. I know we've talked before, but it just in, maybe it's because we're talking one-on-one -on -one for so long. I've learned so much and you, it sounds, it looks like you've got a couple of fans here on the, on the chat. Can I ask you a couple of yeah. questions that have nothing to do with what we're talking about? Sure. Okay. And these are questions I like to ask all of the guests to just kind of, you know, I, I find them interesting questions. Who's been the most influential person in your life? Well, for my career, I'm going to say my first boss, Ernie Patricus. And the okay. advice I give to anybody young is choose your boss well, because mm -hmm. your first boss will have a huge impact. And um, uh, Ernie did something that has stayed with me forever. Uh, there was a big bank in the US, one of the top broker dealers on Wall Street called Drexel, and they failed. They went bust, they were insolvent. Mm -hmm. And they, they were huge, they were so interconnected to all the other banks in New York and in the rest of the world. They were 40% of the junk bond market as a dealer. And they went bust, boom, gone. So um, my boss, Ernie, called us all into the uh, conference room at the New York Fed. Uh, there are about 50 of us in the room. And he sort of glared at us for a minute <laughs> because it was a serious event. We're gonna be very busy. And then he walked over to me. I was, I, I was you know, fairly junior, three, four years in the job. Yeah. And he stared at me and he said, do you know what your job is? And I said, well, I think so. He said, your job is to know everything so that when something goes wrong, you know why and you know what to do about it. And I think I've been trying to live up to that ever since. Wow, the pressure. <laughs> so I, that's one yeah. reason I watched the entire horizon of event risks and yeah. try and yeah. figure out if something happens over there, what's going to happen over here? Mm. Uh, because it is all interconnected. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting that you mentioned your boss um, and it made me think about my first boss, you know, when my first job was as an underwriter for an insurance company and you know how terrible those are in the U S um, and uh, I was there maybe, I want to say about a year and he called me into his office one day and, you know, we got along great. You know, he said I was doing a good job, all that kind of stuff. And he said, I'm going to introduce you to somebody that I think, you know, that, that you need to talk to. And he did that because he knew the company was going out of business. So he wanted to give me an opportunity to go work somewhere else doing the same kind of work that I enjoyed doing. And I was like, mm -hmm. what an unbelievable, you know, thing for somebody to do, to look out for their employee that way. It's just, you know, and I think about that all the time, you know, you, you're working for, you know, you don't work for a company, you work for a manager. And, you know, yeah. if you have a great manager, you're going to love your job. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty simple. And Ernie, yeah. Ernie taught me so much about being a good manager because, um, you know, we, he had a real talent for identifying what people would be good at. 
and giving them mm. more of that and then pushing them and stretching them. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we were all, we were a very different team, very diverse team there. Uh, and, and, but he, he pushed me into areas where at first I was like, I don't know this, but um, it was because he knew that I would take an interest. And once I was stuck yeah. in, I would figure things out that other people wouldn't figure out. Mm. He recognized how he could, how he could push you and what your capabilities were that you didn't know those were your capabilities. Right. So, you know, well, that's uh, it. That, and yeah. you know, it's largely because, Ernie pushed me into systemic risk, into uh, settlement system studies, into derivatives, mm -hmm. uh, and also we deregulated uh, Glass-Steagall. We, we, we allowed a big banking reform while, we were, while I was there. Right. And I right. was on that team as well. Um, that um, at 29, I was brought to the United Kingdom to supervise the mm -hmm. London Stock Exchange, which seemed like a pretty good gig. <laughs> <laughs> and you never left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I moved here temporarily you... along. 32 years ago. Yeah. I'm excited about maybe going to Cuba one day now that I'm a UK citizen, you know, because we can yeah. go as, as uh, British people. So anyway, yeah. I don't know what made me just say that, but um, okay. Well, um, list. So last, what's that? Now you're on a list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, last question. And this, I got this idea from Stephen Bartlett. I don't know if you listen to his podcast, The Diary of a CEO. And one thing that he does at the end of every podcast is the last question he asks is a question from the previous guest. So you probably don't know who my, maybe you do know who my previous guest was, but I asked them to leave you a question and they don't know who the next guest is either. Ooh. So, uh, and this comes from Kirill Iremenko and I interviewed him last week and he runs a company called Super Data Science and he's had over 2.2 million people join his program to learn data science. Um, incredibly influential person in, in the data science space, makes everything very consumable, which is really interesting. So his question was, if you could go back in time and tell your, and tell your past self two words, just two words, what would they be? Oh, that's easy. Data school. <laughs> Kissing up to the host. <laughs> I, no, I, I seriously, I would have been in your first cohort if I'd known about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And it would have transformed what I, uh, it would have been a, a huge um, multiplier in what I can achieve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're seeing that now too. It's really interesting. We, we're seeing people get into careers that it's just fascinating to me, the stuff that they're doing now that they would have never been doing before. And I don't want to take credit for it, but because I'm not the one that puts the work in, I just, you know, I'm like your first boss, right? I'm just giving them a platform that I can push them on because I know they can do it. Um, yeah. So yeah. what question do you have for my next guest? Ooh, you didn't ask me to prepare that. Um, Intentionally. <laughs> um, suppose um, if you could make one policy reform that would be universal in all countries, what would that be? Sorry, typing it out so I didn't forget for later. <laughs> that's a really that's a really tough one because there's it's even hard to think of something that would be universal. Yeah. Let alone, you know. Well, Kathleen, um, I I this has just been fascinating. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, I am gonna go on hiatus for the rest of the year, so I'll be back first week of January with my next guest. And we're going to be talking about the ethics of AI, which is something I'm particularly um, interested in because I don't trust it. Uh, so no. I'm really interested to, to I don't know if I should trust it. Let's put it that way. So, um, so my guest is going to be um, answering lots of questions for me about why I should trust AI. So thank you very much. I want to say thank you for everybody who's commented because these are lovely. Yeah, um, it's great. Nice comments. And, yeah. uh, and thank you, Andy. Um, always a pleasure talking to you. And this is our first one-on-one, -on -one, I think. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to do it again. I'll have, to, I'll, I'll have you back on once, uh, once I see, yeah. you know, see that you've changed the whole direction of the UK economy. Not the UK. I'm not doing one <laughs> at a time. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing 
I, I build for, I, I'm a global yeah. plumber. I'm being selfish. I'm being selfish. Yeah. If I could Great. fix the okay. UK, I would. Yeah, okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Andy. Bye. Bye.